It's another Wednesday night and we will be serving you all the trending stories from NC's news menu. Tonight we begin from Niger's seat of power with President Tinobu's assent to supplementary budget as Senate invites JAM and some tertiary institutions over alleged admission infractions. On security, in line with the renewed hope mantra, House Committee on Police Affairs expresses commitment towards addressing security challenges as Nigerian Air Force exploits emerging technologies to meet national security imperatives. On the off-cycle elections, political parties, INEC and the electorate warm up to hit the polls on Saturday in Bayelsa, Imo and Koge states, with preparations in top gear. And if you reside in Abuja, look out for the Pink Riders as the Minister of Women Affairs and past Nigerian women. Of course, you know, we have the regulars, business, agriculture, health and more, all for you. And you know, the taste of the pudding is in the eating. I'm Elizabeth Omori. Welcome to News Extra. President Bola Tinumbu has signed the 2023 supplementary budget of more than 2.1 trillion naira into law. The signing at the State House was witnessed by principal officers of the National Assembly led by Senate President Gotswe Lakbabu, Speaker Tajuddin Abbas and the Secretary to the Government of the Federation George Akumi, among others. A supplementary appropriation bill was last week submitted to the National Assembly and the National Legislature approved the sum of 2.17 trillion naira. The supplementary budget is to, among other things, take care of military expenditure, make up for the conditional cash transfer and six-month wage award the federal government promised its workers. There is an emerging indication that the national headcount suspended early this year mission hold, as President Bola Tinubu has expressed total support for the conduct of the national census. President Tinubu made the pronouncement at as he launched the National Geospatial Data Repository Electronic Civil Registration and Vital Statistics System in its Coordination Committee at the State House Conference Center. State House Correspondent Musbaut Dawahab tells us more. They usually announce their arrival into the world, but half of their population across the world go unregistered, or at best, only documented locally. At the other extreme of life, the World Health Organization is also concerned that two-thirds of annual deaths globally go unnoticed. The 80,000 women who die in this country from maternal causes should not be forgotten. And this system would help us make that more visible. The digital birth certificate. Now, with the emergence of a digital civil registration and vital statistics system, Nigeria is ready for a catch-up with the developed country's practices with a system to register birth and death of its citizens. And baby Aisha Hamad is the first to get on the list. The objective of uh, the new electronic uh, civil registration of vital statistics system, otherwise known as Vital Red, is to improve data capturing, collation, processing, dissemination, and timely access to statistics on vital events in the country. An efficient civil registration system is the cornerstone of development and governance. It ensures that every life, even event, is not just recorded, but recognized, forming the basis of policies, planning and service delivery that meets the needs of all Nigerians. The global best practice of a system is also to interrogate the causes of death and plan to mitigate morbidity and death rates for more effective public health policies and viable population. On this, President Bola Tinubu expresses his administration's commitment towards generating accurate and reliable demographic data that will serve as building blocks for better socio-economic planning. 
The system will also improve the ability of the federal agencies to generate vital statistics on important population events and migration, further enabling the government to design well-tailored, effective, and efficient policy capable of meeting the needs of Nigerian people. And this is perhaps the most expected moment for the National Population Commission on its suspended census projects. The Commission will therefore be supported in the conduct of the next census. With the launching of a National Coordination Committee and in collaboration with the National Identity Management Commission, this system is also expected to generate demographic data that will also be useful for other relevant agencies. From the State House, Muspao and Wahab, NC News. And President Bola Tinobu has approved the appointment of 20 qualified Nigerians to serve as federal commissioners in the National Population Commission, with nine current federal commissioners reappointed. Ogochukuka Ona compiled the names of the new NPC commissioners as released. The new NPC federal commissioners include Emmanuel Trump, A.K. Abia, Dr. Clifford Zira Adamawa, reappointed, Chidi Christopher Ezeoke Anambra, reappointed, Isa Aoudubirotai Bono, reappointed, Bishop Alex Ukam, Cross River, Blessing Brume Ataguba, Delta. Others are Dr. Jeremiah Ubonna Nwankwegu, Eboi, Dr. Tony Aijino, Edo reappointed, Ejike Eze Enugu reappointed, Abubakar Damburam Gombe reappointed, Professor Uba Nabwe Imo reappointed, Sada Atu Dogrom Bauchi Garba Kaduna, Dr. Aminu Ibrahim Sanyawa Kano, Yori Afolabi Kogi, Olakunle Sobukola Ogun. Also appointed are Temitayo Olusheye Oluatui Ondo, Senator Mudashiru Hussein Oshun reappointed, Mary Ishaya Afan Plateau, Ogiri Itotenan Henry Rivers, and Sunny Saleh Taraba reappointed. The president charges the new and returning NPC federal commissioners to successfully implement all measures taken by his administration to provide an effectively appropriate, accurate population data with which lasting solutions to Nigeria's socio-political and economic challenges can be conclusively developed and executed. President Bola Tinobu is to depart Abuja for Riyadh, South Africa. Saudi Arabia on Thursday the 9th to attend the Saudi Africa Summit holding on the 10th of this month. In a statement, the President will underscore Nigeria's commitment to attract more foreign direct investments and expand business partnerships, which are strongly reinforced by his administration's ongoing domestic economic reforms. Discussions at the first Saudi Africa Summit will revolve around supporting joint action, enhancing political coordination, addressing regional security threats, facilitating economic transformation through research and the local development of new energy solutions. The president will be accompanied by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Yusuf Tugar, Minister of Education and some other cabinet members. The Senate expresses determination to ensure that admission processes into tertiary institutions are carried out with every sense of fairness and in such a manner that the hope of prospective students is not dashed. Senate therefore mandates its committees on tertiary education and public petitions to look into the case of about 300 students who applied to study medicine and surgery at the University of Nigeria and Suka, but allegedly had their admissions truncated. National Assembly correspondent Lami Ali reports on this and other issues considered during plenary. The Deputy Majority Whip of the Senate, Peter Nwebongi, raised the motion as plenary highlighting the travails of some students who applied to study medicine and surgery, law, engineering, among other courses. The provisional admission practice is being used as a malicious tool to exploit and frustrate intelligent young Nigerians who are children and wards of ordinary Nigerians. If this is happening in secondary schools, 
in universities. What are we saying? It's a big problem. The University of Nigeria has a reputation. JAM has its own reputation. The, the Latin phraseology applies here, which is Odi uh, Autem Patem. Let the other side be heard. Senate adopted a motion seeking to immortalize the late Ohinoyi of Iberaland, Ado Ibrahim, as requested by Senator Natasha Apotiodwa. He was an eminent and committed leader, an incisive thinker and a philanthropist whose interest is to serve both people and humanity. By the grace of God Almighty, with all the good things that he has done, in this, that he did in this world, Almighty Allah will grant him a to fill house. A minute silence was observed in his honor. The president of the Senate, Godwill Akpabio, brought to the, the notice of members the a Senate. presidential communication the requesting Mr. the confirmation of the executive vice chairman of the National Communications Commission, Aliyu Maida. Other features at plenary include the first reading of five bills, among them the bill seeking to amend the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission Act. In another development, Senate Committee on Finance has engaged government agencies on their remittances to the Federation accounts as Nigeria tidy subbooks to prepare for 2024 budget. Agencies at the meeting include the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, the Federal Road Safety Commission, Nigeria Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Agency, and the Nigeria Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, which the committee made some observations relating to figures submitted. Given the three different figures we have seen, what is your expectation for 2023? At the end of the year, our audited account should give the federal government exact figure we have generated as it is right now i am in the dark as to what we expect in 2023 do you get it because uh, a reconciliation will probably be looming that i don't know what the outcome is going to be the committee insists that heads of ministries departments and agencies must appear in person from the national assembly lami ali nta news Meanwhile, cases of abduction of some prospective core members by criminal gangs have been in the front burner in recent times, and this is not going down well with lawmakers at the Green Chambers. Consequently, the House of Representatives has passed a resolution mandating the Inspector General of Police to take over the investigations of abducted prospective core members towards ensuring their swift and safe rescue. National Assembly correspondent Mitari Ikmin reports on this and other issues at today's plenary. Sequel to a motion of urgent public importance sponsored by Representative Uyime Idem and nine other lawmakers, the House condemns the abduction of prospective core members, describing the trend as worrisome. On November 1, 2023, an Aquaribum Transport Company, AKTC, vehicle conveying passengers from Uyo, to Kogi State was hijacked by a gunman, and a core member from Akwaibom State, Ms. Imabong Samuel, was on her way to her place of primary assignment, PPA, abducted alongside 11 other members, with an initial 15 million naira ransom currently negotiated to 2 million naira, placed as a prerequisite uh, for each release. Five bills passed second reading at Wednesday's plenary. They include the bill for an act to amend the Nigeria Minerals and Mining Act 2007, as well as the bill for an act to regulate corporate social responsibility in Nigeria. The corporate social responsibility bill seeks to mandate and regulate social responsibility in Nigeria by establishing a monitoring unit housed within the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning. Concern about the current challenges bedeviling the solid mineral sector because of illegal mining activities. To amend the Nigeria Mining and Minerals Act 2007 to provide for the regulation of artisanal mining and the provision of stiffer penalties for offenses. Some infrastructure related motions were also adopted. The Federal Ministry of Water Resources to provide funds for the rehabilitation and upgrading of Urukesun Dam. That's a local government area in 2024 budget estimate. Urge the Federal Ministry of Works to include the development of underpasses at Wawa and Kara sections of the Lagos Ibadan Expressway before the demobilization of the contractor currently working 
in that axis. At its inaugural sitting, the House Committee on Federal Capital Territory urged the FCT administration to step up its revenue drive to fast-track development of the nation's capital. There are many ways FCT losing revenues. I've told you, most of these are estates in Abuja. They don't have title documents. The Honourable Minister is providing five kilometer roads in niche of the area councils. From the National Assembly, Mitairi Ikwen. NTA News. Let's talk health. Nigeria has the highest malaria burden in the world. With a 2021 malaria indicator survey uh, saying an estimated 63 million cases and more than 190 deaths due to the disease. Experts in the fight against malaria parasite prevalence in Nigeria are now seeking new sources of domestic funding and how the programs can be flexible enough to respond to the disease dynamics. This is the aim of the visit of the Global Chief Executive of Malaria Consortium, Dr. James Tibenderana, to Nigeria. Olushe Adiabu tells us more. Being bitten by an infected female Anopheles mosquito is what gives people malaria, as study shows. Records also indicate that in 2021, more than 600,000 people died from the disease in 85 countries. More than two-thirds of those deaths were children under five living in Africa. This data is coming more than 20 years after the gathering of Africa's heads of governments at the Abuja Summit, which the leaders committing to the plan of action to roll back malaria. The statistics have become better over the years, though. But what I want, I think, all of us to appreciate is that Nigeria has made huge progress. The Malaria Consortium believes every single state in Nigeria and 97% of the country's population are at risk of malaria, but also acknowledges lessons have been learned in the 20 years of Malaria Consortium's involvement in the disease control. And what has happened is that the mosquito and the parasite has had to adapt to the huge coverage that we have achieved in many countries. And one of the things we need to get better at, which we have learned, we must have the next generation of new drugs. We must have the next generation of insecticide, the next generation of nets. As you've said, the next generation of vaccines. And as we speak, the seasonal malaria chemical prevention is happening in Abuja. And every year, not only in Abuja, in the 13 states where SMC is happening, we are covering close to 20 million Nigerians. The truth of the matter is malaria control efforts in Nigeria are donor driven. And since the disease is preventable and curable, members of the Malaria Consortium are keeping hopes alive on optimal coverage of interventions such as insecticide treated nets, indoor resistant spraying, and the malaria vaccine, among others. In Abuja, Olusheye Adiagbo, NT News. And joining me in the studio to shed more light on the issues raised in that report is the newly appointed Global Chief Executive Officer, Malaria Consortium, Dr. James Tibet Derana. Dr. James, thank you for joining us on News Extra. Thank you very much. Thank you it's so much. It's a pleasure much. to be here. Thank you. Now, malaria is one of the main public health issues in tropical Africa and a leading cause of death, especially in children under five and pregnant women. Now, based on your intervention in 11 countries, of course, Nigeria inclusive, what can you tell us about the high and low points, um, as well as opportunities for malaria burdened countries? I would say the high points are that over the last 20 years, there's been huge progress in increasing coverage with insecticide treated nets, the use of indoor residual spraying, and using rapid diagnostic tests to test for malaria as close to the home as possible and giving the right treatment. We have seen over the last two decades a huge investment from donors, from national governments to ensure that these proven tools are accessible to everyone who can access them. We've also seen that the nets that we've deployed have had huge impact 
they've been responsible for reducing up to about 70% of malaria cases. So what we've seen over the two decades, for example, in Nigeria, about 15 years ago, the prevalence of malaria was about 42%. And now the prevalence is roughly at about 22%. However, we are lagging behind. Yes. The progress has stalled. Funding has stalled. And we need to cost correct and consider what needs to be done to be back on track. Okay. All right, Dr. James, uh, let's touch on the new tools for malaria prevention and treatment. For a country like Nigeria, what do we need to do to fast track efforts at elimination? I would say there are two major things. The first thing is that the interventions that work, like nets and drugs, should be accessible to everyone. We still find that 50% of households have access to nets. And of those, only about 50% of those are using the nets consistently. So the first thing is that whatever tools, whether they're nets, whether they're correct drugs, we need to ensure that everyone should have access and should be using them consistently. Okay. And then we have new tools such as the malaria vaccine, next generation nets. These have to be deployed to the right places and importantly they have to be deployed on a strong health system that's built around national priorities. And this is why it's good to see the vision of the Ministry of Health to ensure that health outcomes are achieved and domestic financing is increased. Okay, all right, you know, uh, seasonal malaria chemo prevention has been a major component of your interventions. Let's have your thoughts on African countries and level of response when it comes to taking ownership of prevention and treatment strategies. We have seen with seasonal malaria chemo prevention that when we work collectively together, we can achieve high coverage. About 15 years ago, only about 200,000 children in probably Nigeria were accessing seasonal malaria chemo prevention. And now, more than 20 million children in Nigeria are accessing this intervention. And so, with partnerships, with governments in the lead, everything is possible. However, what we have seen is that national governments need to match leadership with domestic financing. And this is a big constraint that we find needs to be addressed urgently. Okay, so do you consider the media a strategic partner in malaria control and elimination? Certainly, the media is a very, very key partner because getting the information out there to every household, getting the information to those of us who think because we live in cities, we are not at risk, and making sure that the right information is passed on. Because one of the things we want to avoid is misinformation. And so the media, you are key, and we look forward to continuing the partnership with you. Okay. Now, let me ask you this final question. I want to take you back to the issue of uh, children under five and pregnant women. You have been to African countries. You have the data. Are we doing enough to reduce the burden on pregnant women and children under five? Because most of them die for the children under five before they are five. I think the answer is in two halves. Okay. We are doing a lot. And the other half, we are still very far behind. Okay. A lot needs to be done. Africa needs to take ownership. Our governments, our leaders need to prioritize malaria as a disease that has economic impact and therefore needs to be eliminated. We have to have elimination as the goal. It can't be control. We need a world free of malaria. And if Nigeria does not eliminate malaria, the world cannot be free of malaria. The world cannot be free. All right, Dr. James Tibenderana, I want to thank you so much for joining us on Music Extra today. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for having me. And we would like to congratulate you on your new appointment. Thank you. Thank you.
Still talking health, they say health is wealth. If you're in disagreement as the sick to choose between money and wellness. No wonder the federal government developed a national health insurance strategy to bridge gaps in accessing health care services in the country. The strategy is intended to make health care available and affordable to the people, bearing in mind that a healthy nation is how well the nation. You see, health is again tied to wealth. Health correspondent Uchi Oguchuku in this report examines the quality of services provided by the National Health Insurance Scheme vis-a-vis -vis the response from enrollees. In 1999, Nigeria floated a National Health Insurance Scheme, NHIS, to provide affordable health care services for government employees. The scheme recorded initial success, but beneficiaries had lots of negative experiences. And you get the approval code, even after you get the approval code, it says expire after a day. So if you are in a hospital, you come today, come back tomorrow, say the approval code has expired. To address these and several other weaknesses, the federal government in 2022 repealed the NHIS Act and established the National Health Insurance Authority, NHIA. This makes health insurance mandatory for all Nigerians, formal and informal sectors, and by this, the over 70% of Nigerians who pay for health out of pocket will be alleviated from poverty. We are doing everything through accreditation, quality assurance, uh, to ensure that the best quality of care is provided. We've been able to elevate or save number of people's life because those drugs are quite expensive and then um, sourcing for the drugs and looking for money health as getter is also reduced. There are now improvements, but much more needs to be done. When my wife had an issue, so yes, it helped because uh, I couldn't, I didn't pay as much as I would have, I would have paid. They are okay in tests, in some other areas that they, they say I should do tests, I should do this and that, they are helping us. With the NHIA, government helps to increase and improve health coverage to meet the universal health coverage target. However, the experiences of some beneficiaries indicate that such hopes will be realized if current concerns are addressed to build public confidence and get more Nigerians enrolled in the act. Uche Ugochuko, NCA News. Thank you, Uche. Health is truly wealth. We now take a break. More to come after this. Stay with us. You're still watching News Extra. Minister of Information and National Orientation Mohammed Idris has reiterated federal government's commitment to the timely establishment of a UNESCO Category 2 Institute for Media and Information Literacy in Nigeria. Sally Ogwanara reports. At a bilateral meeting with the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Communication and Information, Dr. Taufik Jelassi, on the sidelines of UNESCO's 42nd General Conference in Paris, France, the minister expressed determination to ensure that Nigeria benefits from all existing opportunities in the UNESCO communications and information sector including the development of community radio, which is one of UNESCO's ongoing priorities. We are grateful to UNESCO for instituting that media uh, information literacy in Nigeria. Nigeria is uh, going to become a hub uh, if that is consolidated. Um, government has taken proactive steps to first to get a fiscal structure for the MIL and then to also uh, you know, work with UNESCO to deepen the technical capability of journalists around the country so that at least credible information, honest information and uh, timely information can be provided. We, we believe that that is the only way that uh, democracy can take its root. The minister also highlighted Nigeria's democratic development under the current administration. A democracy in Nigeria is taking a stand. Um, uh, you can see that uh, after the inauguration of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, uh, of course the opposition went to court and it's their democratic right. Uh, but that has been exhausted now. The Supreme Court has uh, pronounced uh, uh, President Bola Chinubu as the legitimate winner of the election. Nigeria's pledge to establish and host the Institute for Media and Information Literacy in Nigeria emerged 
from the 2022 UNESCO Global Media and Information Literacy Week hosted by Nigeria in October 2022 and was endorsed by a resolution of the 216th session of the UNESCO Executive Board. Saliu Guanara, NTA News. Still on the UNESCO conference, the Minister of Education, Professor Tahiru Maman, says the federal government will sustain the national homegrown school feeding program to ensure better education for all in Nigeria. This was at the 42nd session of the General Conference of UNESCO holding in Paris, France. Saliu Guanara once again brings us details. Tahir Maman, Minister of Education. Renewed of reforms in Nigeria education sector with numerous programs targeted at vulnerable children through the National Commission for Almajuri and Out of School Children was highlighted. To increase the employability of our youth, Nigeria has developed critical innovations such as open, distance, and flexible e learning systems, STEM education, inclusive education for the challenged. Nigeria Skills Qualification Framework and Tertiary Education Research Application and Services Platform. Let me also inform you that Nigeria is greening her curriculum with climate change and environmental education contents at basic and senior education levels to enhance understanding of environmental justice and global citizenship. The minister sought for UNESCO's continuous support. Excellencies, Nigeria appreciates the successful outcomes of the Nigeria UNESCO cooperation over the years. However, the recent development in the Abuja office, especially location of communication information sector to the multi-sectoral regional office in Dakar is a concern. While the Abuja component is functional, the Dakar component is not, and no budgetary appropriation as yet. We therefore appeal UNESCO relocates all the sectors to the Abuja office. We will make sure that on the renewed of President Vola Ahmed Tinubu, we use the National Assembly to support youth inclusiveness, to support gender equality. And I will say for me, I'm really very pleased to have this uh, very strong team from Nigeria, very brilliant and active with experts from different agencies within the uh, sector of uh, UNESCO and they want to interact, to network, to be able to look at issues that actually will make the membership of Nigeria in UNESCO a very, very strong one. Nigeria is up for election into the UNESCO Executive Board and other intergovernmental committees of UNESCO. Saliu Guanara, NTA News. Now let's shift attention to the oil and gas sector. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC Limited, announces the introduction of Nembe crude oil grade into the international crude oil market. The announcement of the Nembe crude oil blend produced by IHO, the operator of the NNPC IHO Oil Mining Lease, OML 29 joint venture, was made at the ongoing Argos European Crude Conference in London. OML 29, an asset located onshore Nigeria, is operated by IHO Eastern Exploration and Production Limited, Africa's leading indigenous hydrocarbon producer following her historic acquisition from Shell in 2014. A statement by Olufemi Shonaya, Chief Corporate Communications Officer, NNPC Limited, reveals that the unique selling point of the Nembe crude oil grade with an API gravity was highlighted by both the ITO and NNPC Limited leadership at the Angus Conference in London. The Nembe crude oil grade also has a low sulfur content and low carbon footprint due to flat gas elimination fitting perfectly into the required specifications of major buyers in Europe. Two cargoes of 950,000 barrels each of the Nembe crude oil grade have since been exported to France and the Netherlands with its attractive assay of API 29 and low sulfur content. The Nembe crude oil grade commands a premium to the global Brent benchmark. With the NNPC ITO oil mining lease or ML 29 joint venture back on stream, Nigeria now boasts of an additional crude oil export of two cargoes at 950,000 barrels each per month and 1.21 billion cubic feet of export gas monthly. The Nembe crude oil export terminal was licensed in line with the extant laws and crude oil 
terminal establishment regulations. The terminal was conceived as a floating storage and offloading vessel with a storage capacity of 2 million barrels and the ability to offload crude oil to any export tanker from AFMAX to very large crude carriers. With a loading capacity of 25,000 barrels per hour and will be exporting over 3.6 million barrels to crude oil monthly at full scale of operation. Meanwhile, the Nigerian Upspring, Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission is reeling out two new regulations to sanitize operations in the oil and gas sector. These are the draft Upstream Petroleum Code of Conduct and Compliance Regulations and the draft Nigerian Upstream Regulatory Petroleum Administrative Harmonization Regulation. Leader Samson reports that, in line with provisions of the Petroleum Industry Act, the Commission is engaging industry players for input to the regulations. Gone are the days when regulations are single-handedly doled out. Now, the revolution brought about by the PIE is continuously engaging key players for their inputs for a win-win robust operations. Head Compliance and Enforcement, NUPLC, Kingston Chukwendu, reiterates the Commission's determination to ensure global best practices and behavior in the sector. We have made significant progress. We consider these engagements uh, very, very important and serious. And so far, what we have seen, the results that we have seen is that uh, we've had, um, the outcome is that we've had regulations that have the buy-in of uh, the industry and members of the public. So as you can uh, see from that, it will now make the job that the uh, commission is doing a lot more easier. Also to be digested by industry players is the draft amendment to the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Host Communities Development Regulation 2022. This makes it three regulations that are drafted for the ongoing stakeholders' engagement. The Commission lauded feedback from similar efforts towards revolutionizing the upstream sector. In Abuja, Lydia Samson, NTA News. A bit from the judiciary, the High Court of the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, has granted bail to the former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emefile. The presiding judge, Justice Olukayode Adibola Adeni, gave the order this Wednesday in Abuja in a ruling on the bail application argued by Matthew Burkar, SAN. Justice Adeni held that it is in the best interest of justice and fair play, especially the provision of Section 35 of Nigeria's Constitution, to follow the rule of law. The federal government, the Attorney General of the Federation and the, financial, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission opposed the bail application. Justice Adeni, who granted the bill, hinged his decision on the fact that Emefili had stayed in government's custody beyond the time stipulated by law. The court also predicates its decision on the fact that the federal government had completed investigation into the allegations against the former CBN chief and had prepared the charge against him as far as August this year. Emefili is to deposit his traveling passport with the registrar of the court pending its formal arraignment on the 15th of November 2023. Thanks for staying with the NTA. Now we begin this segment with Electro Matters. The choice of Temperate Silver as the next governor of Bayelsa State will never be regretted by the electorate and it will be a new dawn in the area of development in the state. Nigeria's Vice President Kashim Shatima gave the assurance at the grand finale of the All Progressives Congress Gubanitera Rally in Bayelsa State ahead of Saturday's election. State House Correspondent Abdurrahman Jibrila reports. A rousing welcome at the grand finale of APC campaign ahead of the Saturday's governorship election comes a good news by Vice President Kashim Shatima informing by all sons of a holistic plan for the development of the Niger Delta and all parts of Nigeria in terms of infrastructure, the technological advancement, education and harnessing of the bountiful resources. A total commitment to the Nigerian project is part of President Tinibu's dream in a rush to ensure the speedy development of the region. This is the more reason why all Bayelsans must come out on Saturday, according to the Vice President, to rally around the party and its candidate, Timepe Silva. National Chairman of the APC, Abdullah Higanduji, described Silva as a refined technocrat and a politician, 
who is committed to transforming and redefining the political, economic, and developmental landscape of Bielsa State. The Vice President was earlier received on arrival in the state by the Bielsa State Governor and some members of the Bielsa State Executive Council. In company of Chief Silva, he later proceeded to pay homage to the Chairman of Bielsa State Traditional Rulers Council, King Bubarai Dakolo. Abraham Jibrila, NTA News. And from Imo, we now move to, uh, from Bayelsa, we now move to other states where governorship candidates of various political parties participating in the November 11 off-site governorship election have signed a peace pact for a violence-free governorship poll. The signing of the peace accord at the instance of the National Peace Committee in collaboration with Independent National Electoral Commission, European Union and other stakeholders is meant to bind political parties, candidates and their supporters to resort to constitutional means if they are dissatisfied with electoral outcomes. By Elsa State, just like some other states in the country, has had a history of violence during political campaigns and elections. But the signing of the peace accord by candidates of political parties in Bielsa ahead of the election is a reassurance that they will play by the rules. Chairman National Peace Committee, former head of state, General Abdul Salami Abubakar, represented by the convener, NPC, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, is advocating for peaceful and stable democratic process in the state. He reassures Bielsans of the NPC's commitment to continue to nurture peace and unity in Nigeria's democratic system. Please, I want to add my voice. Vote to stay alive. Vote to see a great violence. These events should be a celebration of who we are and our trust in democracy. All political parties and candidates are hereby reassured of the Commission's neutrality. Violence should feel confident that their votes Present at the signing of the Peace Pact are gubernatorial candidates of the NNPP, SDP, PRP, PDP, APC, ADP, excluding the Labour Party governorship candidates who failed to turn up for the exercise. The candidates affirms their readiness to play by the rules to ensure a free, fair and credible election in the state. The peace in this state is because the body language of the governor is peaceful. For us in the APC, we are very happy that this is happening because we've always stood for peace and we will hope that uh, other parties also will obey and abide by the peace accord. I mean, While Bielsons anticipate a peaceful election, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, says preparation is in top gear as non-sensitive electoral materials have been moved to the eight local government areas of the state. In Yenegua, Baratwaipre Awe, NTA News. Meanwhile, the 2023 off-cycle governorship election were not holding 38 polling units in Imo State. This is as a result of zero registration in the affected polling units. INEX Chairman Professor Mahmoud Yakubu disclosed this at the election stakeholders meeting held by the Commission in Oweri. Beatrice Ayim reports that the event was almost marred by a chaotic moment. The election stakeholders meeting on Imo State Governorship election of November 11, 2023, convened by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to brief stakeholders on the Commission's preparedness ahead of the election, was almost marred by a chaotic moment following an order and counter order that the press should not cover the interactive part of the event. Hence, it was later resolved. INEC chairman represented by the National Commissioner supervising Eastern States, Kenneth Ukago, says out of the 4,758 polling units in the state, the election will only hold in 4,720 polling units due to zero registration in 38 polling units. The INEC National Commissioner notes that adequate arrangement has been made for transportation of the electoral materials and ad hoc staff to various locations to avoid last-minute disappointment, as witnessed in the February presidential election in the state. He reassures that the beavers will be used for accreditation and uploading of results to the IRF. Representing that five point eight percent of the registered voters have been collected. The total number of PPCs collected will be used to determine the margin of lead principle. 
as provided in the Commission's regulations and guidelines, as well as the Electoral Act 2022. The Inspector General of Police, represented by the Assistant Commissioner of Police, Imo State, Musa Abdullahi, assures of adequate security to enable the people go about their normal businesses during the period. We are prepared to defend and protect everybody's lives and properties as much as we can with the little resources we have. Stakeholders during the interactive session expressed their thoughts on the process. In a way, Beatrice Anyam, NTN. In the Corps Marshal Federal Road Safety Court, Dauda Alibi directs the deployment of 1,500 personnel of the Corps in 35 vehicles, including tow trucks and ambulances, to each of the states having governorship elections this Saturday. This is part of preparations towards ensuring a smooth conduct of the forthcoming elections in Imo, Kogi, and Bayosa states. The Corps Marshal, in a statement, orders operatives of the Corps drafted to cover the elections to ensure effective collaboration with the Nigerian police. INIC and other security agencies in the enforcement of restrictions on vehicular movement. The statement mandates them to clear obstructions from the roads, carry out rescue operations in case of emergencies, and maintain orderliness in polling booths. It wants personnel to play active roles in the democratic exercise. The Corps Marshal also wants the electorate in the states to comply with all regulations. The Inspector General of Police, Coyote Egbetogun, restates the commitment of security agencies to ensure a peaceful conduct of the Kogi state governorship election. He stated this during a critical stakeholders meeting on election management in Lokoja. Correspondent Solomon Aideng reports that the IGP warned troublemakers to embrace peace or face the wrath of the law. The visit to Kogi State by the Inspector General of Police, Kaudi Egbetokun, just three days before the governorship election termed a critical stakeholders meeting, aims to promote cooperation among traditional rulers, Nigerian police officers, and those deployed for election management. This is with the goal of ensuring a peaceful election. The visit also emphasizes that the police and other security agencies have zero tolerance for election violence, warning troublemakers to choose peace during and after the electoral process or face consequences. Police and other security agencies will not give space for criminals to disrupt this election. In addition, IG Egberto can urge police personnel to maintain neutrality and professionalism. He and his team also paid a costly visit to Governor Yahya Bedu at the government house, reiterating their commitment to achieving a peaceful, credible and acceptable election in Kogi State. I want to appeal to all parties, all candidates in this election, to please embrace peace and please warn their supporters to shun all acts of violence during this election. We are very confident that you are going to make you proud to be the state that is most peaceful out of these three states and even compared to other general elections in the past. This visit to Kogi State marked IGP Kaudi Egbetokun's first since his appointment in Lokoja, Solomon Ayedehi, NTA News. To other developments, the ongoing reforms in the Nigeria Police Force must meet international best practices to combat contemporary internal security challenges. To achieve this, the Ministry of Police Affairs is collaborating with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Minister of Police Affairs sought the collaboration when the UNDP delegation visited him in Abuja. Francis Vaughan brings us details of the meeting. This is the first engagement between the Ministers of Police Affairs and the UNDP. The discussion is on partnership towards elevating policing standards, supporting greater accountability, and fostering deeper collaboration for effective policing. Collaboration, coordination, and mutual respect would be the cornerstones of our partnership as we strive to create a safer and more secure environment for all. What we want is to have a reform paper that is going to actually be implemented and accepted by all. We all know that from community to community we face various kind of insecurity challenges. So whatever we're going to deploy is going to be tailored fit. More 
The resident representative of the UNDP, Mohamed Yahya, applauded the commitment of the Nigerian government towards police reforms, adding that UNDP remains committed to supporting this effort through partnership with the German Foreign Office. We are available uh, with our technical capacity and, uh, and know-how and financial uh, capabilities to be able to tell you we're behind you. We want to support Mr. President, agenda for police reform, and we will provide your team a detailed note on all the kind of investment we made, more importantly, the kind of investment we want to do. Okay. The ministers pointed out that the UNDP's project on police reform is a significant initiative, and the federal government is committed to promoting effective and accountable policing practice in Nigeria. Francis from NTN News. Still on crime fighting, the negative effects of cyber crimes on society have been of paramount concern to law enforcement agencies in Nigeria. Hence, authorities have commenced the process of amending the Cyber Crimes Prohibition Act 2015 to incorporate new realities like artificial intelligence. To this effect, cyber security and law experts are meeting at a cyber crimes awareness campaign in Abuja to seek enduring ways of preventing the crime acts. Olabodi Arewa reports. Artificial intelligence, Google search engine, Facebook and so on. These are the new normal in our world, driven primarily by the use of technology. Technology experts say is liable to infiltration by hackers or to being cloned, driven by non-awareness of locking dangers from those who hack online information as it is now easier and smarter to conduct our daily affairs online it has equally become easier and smarter for cyber criminals, uh, cyber criminals to explore vulnerabilities on digital platforms to perform their solid enterprise under the cloak of anonymity experts at the cyber crimes awareness campaign organized by the federal ministry of justice also say that more introspection by social media users would help them avoid pitfalls associated with cyber criminals hacking their data. It is notorious that the breach of cyber security in an organization is followed by major threats to the data privacy and daily oper oper operations of the organization. They hope to leverage on the link between technology and the law to put in place more encompassing regulations that would guide the practice and use of the cyberspace. Olabo Darewa, NCA News. Now, increase in votes allocated for infrastructure development by government at all levels, active involvement of alumni and prudent management of lean resources by university administrators are suggestions that can help universities stay afloat in times of economic crisis. This is the submission of the 26th, 27th and 28th Convocation Lecture of the University of Oyo by Professor Philip Uso Afaha. Edidion Iba reports. The Convocation Lecturer, who is also the Vice-Chancellor, Administration, University of Abuja, Professor Philip Usoafara, in his lecture titled, University Education in Times of National Economic Crisis, notes that a depressed economy such as experienced in Nigeria causes a reduction in the funds allocated to universities, and these negatively impact Nigerian universities as they are not able to compete at the global level. Professor Philip Afara argues that emphasis by proprietors of universities should be on the quality of education and not necessarily in the number of universities established. Hence, there is a need for upgrade of facilities in already existing universities. Government must be prudent in the management of national economy by blocking leakages in the federation account that have been passed pervasive with the endemic public corruption. There is also need for the university administrators to exercise prudence in the management of lean resources allocated to them and engage the international community and the business community for their support and assistance. Vice Chancellor of the University of Uyo, Professor Nyaudo Ndayu, notes that the lecture is apt as the university system needs the combined efforts of all to ensure its all round success, commending the lecturer for the expository lecture. For me, it was a great exposition. It was also a great exposition. The economic crisis has difference, and most cases, negative on education. 
Professor Philip Wusoafaga, an alumnus of the Department of History and International Studies, University of Uyo, is a member of many professional bodies, including the World History Association, a fellow of the African School of Diplomacy, among others. In Uyo, Edith Yongiba, NTA News. Former President Mohamed Buhari, while receiving members of the Nigeria Turkish College on a visit, advocated more synergy between the two countries in the areas of health and education. Also received by the former president are members of the Northern House of Musician Group, who assured him of their continued loyalty. Hussein Suleiman reports. Members of the Nigeria Turkish College were led by the managing director of the college, Pezullah Belijin. He said the visit is a recognition of the laudable contributions that Nigeria health and education sectors receive during the Buhari administration. Just the uh, expression of the gratitude. I see. Thank you very much indeed. He has shown a great leadership. And in addition to this, for our own community, particularly in Turkish people, so we have always seen him supporting and helping. So when it is about education, when it is about health, so he is not putting sentiment into his decisions, but he is looking for the interest of the country, the best interest of the country. Education and health, and these are the basic things uh, for any society. So I thank you very much for uh, helping us in our development processes, and uh, I assure you I will never forget uh, that experience. Also received by the former president was the group of northern musicians. The musicians recall the numerous contribution of the former president toward achieving unity and progress of Nigeria. So we are here to see the former president. Uh, he's like a father to us. We are seeking for his blessing for our association. The former president, who appreciated contribution of the House of Musicians, also advised them to exhibit maturity by showing respect not only among themselves but to any deserving person. In Daura, Hussein Suleiman, NTA News. It's time to talk business. Nigerians in Diaspora Commission has received assurances from the Central Bank of Nigeria that bottlenecks will be removed to maximize remittances to the country. This was the outcome of an engagement between the NITCAM and the CBN to strengthen partnership that will impact the country's economy. The largest powers in sub-Saharan Africa, um, over $22 billion, and we believe there can even be more if the encumbrances are removed, and that is the role the CPA can play. Now, we have state diaspora focal offices all over Nigeria now. So in every state, somebody is representing the diaspora. If you're investing in your country, you're coming to invest in a state, not in Abuja. So we're doing that. You spoke about the concern about tax on remittances, and of course you spoke about the desire to deepen the relationship with the central bank. Well. I would look into the um, issue of the remittances because whatever it is that serves as a bottleneck, we will do what we can to ensure that we are able to take it out. Assurance our prices remained under pressure on Wednesday after sliding to their lowest in a more than three months in the previous session, slipping further on concern over waning demand in the United States and China. Brent crude features dipped eight cents to eighty one dollars fifty three cents a barrel, while West Texas Intermediate crude lost twenty cents to seventy seven dollars seventeen cents. Both had dropped on Tuesday to their lowest since July twenty fourth. And Nigerian equities further appreciated today with investors gaining 87 billion naira and the market inches closer to the 71,000 mark. A total of 558.3 million shares in 6,401 deals corresponding to a market value of 9.794 billion were traded. Today's data shows 24% improvement in volume, 80% improvement in turnover, but 10% decline in deals. The current market capitalization is 38.9 trillion naira. 
FBN Holdings recorded the highest volume of 210 million traded shares, followed by United Bank for Africa, 53.7 million, and Universal Insurance Company, 43.7 million. That is Business News. News Extra continues with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, it's nice doing business with you. Always, Penny. Always. Thank you. Now to agriculture, just like in humans and other animals, plants also suffer afflictions in the form of diseases. Uh, it was only a few months ago that uh, the story of a mysterious ginger infection emerged, leaving farmers of the spice root in a kind of limbo. In southern Kaduna, where the root is largely cultivated, farmers are beginning to harvest. Abdullahi Mohammed, however, reports that majority of them are counting more losses than gains. Heading south of Kaduna, breathtaking scenery, suitable weather, and harvest period setting in movement of produce at its peak. Kachia, my first port of call, one of the hubs for the production of ginger, and the people proud of the produce. We are people of ginger. Ginger is our gold, ginger is our uranium, ginger is our uh, crude oil. We, we normally even give it a name now, we call it ginger dollar. This ginger dollar has been flowing for long, but for this year, many of the farmers have had their fingers burnt following a mysterious infection to their crop. When I come to the farm, I started to discover that some stem of the ginger it started to dry up. It is now harvest time. The diggers doing their own thing. Standing by a devastated ginger farmer, disappointed with the harvest. This is the case with millions of other farmers caught in the web of the ginger disease. And all they are struggling to salvage seeds for the next planting season. Do you expect that this will help? Tom, I just want to try it and see maybe. A drive towards Kwai in Jaba local government area, a local market. Kenya market is located in Kagoko local government area of Kaduna state. This local market is a place where at this point in time, where harvest of ginger is at its peak, activities here, buying and selling of that produce will also be at its peak. But what we want to find out, looking at what we have found out in the farms, is whether such is the case this time around. Supplies here are scanty, with a rise in price that doesn't help the farmer. A farmer bring only one bag, and that's the only ginger he has this year. He sold at a rate of 50,000. Even though the price increased, but it's a loss. While wondering how help can come to the farmers, one of the representatives of the people gave me hope. So we are calling on government to really come to our aid and to assist our people with seed and also finances. Nigeria remains one of the major global producers of ginger and a blow to these ginger producing area is a blow to Nigeria's place in the global market. From Kachia in Kaduna State, Abdullah Mohammed, NT News. Skin on traveling abroad have been advised to always be mindful of the false cliche that the grass is always greener on the other side, which could lead to unpleasant situations outside the shores of the country. The advice was given by the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and Internally Displaced Persons at Murtala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos, while receiving the Libya returnees, Larry Bilay, who was with the Commission at the airport complex. The story. This Boeing 737 with flight number UZ189 taxiing on the runway is the third batch of Nigerian returnees in two months, says officials of the commission. President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Mr. President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, welcome you all of you back to Nigeria. Most of them have stranded Nigerians in Libya who decided to return home through the opening created by the International Organization for Migration, IOM. It's usually voluntary in the sense that people do come to IOM offices or meet the counselors, and so we identify those persons who are in a situation where they say, okay, I'm willing to go back home. And um, so it depends on the country. It's different for each and, each and every country. 
there's some countries where someone would feel, okay, my visa has expired, I'm not longer able to work, it's better for me to go back to Nigeria. There's some, maybe the expectation of what they met there is not what they'd anticipated. And so in those circumstances, uh, depending on availability of funding, we're able to support their return. Well, these are 161 returnees being received through assisted voluntary repatriation into the country. They are Nigerians from Libya. And the Commissioner for Refugees and Migration stated areas, ways and process in which they will be eased into the society. Provide them with psychological support. After having spent about five days there, we will give them the orientation. We orient them and integrate them into the, into the society. And then after five days, we now allow them, depending on where they are coming from, in, con in conjunction with the IOM, transport them back to their various destinations. And also ensure that uh, you are being trained and retrained so that as they arrived, they should have something doing. Some of the returnees declined camera interview claiming fatigue. The 161 returnees, which include adult, male, 37, female, 116 children of both sexes and eight infants were documented by the immigration officials under the guidance of officials of the commission. In Lagos, Larry Bilayi, NTA News. Well, it's good to be home. Let's join our sports desk for the latest in the world of sports. The main organizing committee for the 2024 National Sports Festival in Ogo State have been challenged to ensure that teething problems of logistics that mostly affect the general well-being and performances of athletes are given priority in their planning. This they say we give the festival befitting Atlo for sponsorship and general optimal performance. That means that we a synergy of the two bodies that will be organizing this uh, uh, national first festival, which by now should begin to think of being self-sustaining, just like we have the Olympic Games being self. Meanwhile, the under-15 National School Football Championship has climbed Wednesday in Abuja with National Grammar School Nike Nugu and Fusla Academy Abuja emerging winners in both boys and girls categories. The National Grammar School Nike won five form penalties against KFA School of Illawarra. The president of the Nigerian School Sports Federation explained that the school sports is aimed at reviving sports development culture in schools. We've been calling on well-meaning Nigerian corporate organizations to ensure that we give our kids the opportunity to succeed. Because when you participate in sports, it's amazing. It's, you know, the, the character that you're able to build, the qualities that you're able to get from participation in sport is what every child is entitled to. In Sports Update with Austin Ends News Extra today, thank you so much for your time. I'm Elizabeth. Omori, do have an awesome night rest. Information is power. Everyone wants power. So feel powerful with the NTA News mobile app, the one-stop information center, real news at your fingertip. Be the first to report by uploading first-hand information on the U Report link. And be the first to know by simply clicking on any of the links on the sidebar for headlines, domestic and foreign news, economy, security, politics, sports, and more. Stream live on your smartphone and tablets and stay connected. It's pretty easy. Simply download NTA News app from your Google Play Store and you're good to go. NTA News mobile app. Your access to real-time information.